Okay, so then you get that kind of criticism, but then you move to the real extremes which you hear today all over college campuses, and if you're on the internet, you see it all over the internet. And this is just amazing, that people can, with a straight face, utter the following words, and you find it, just Google these words and you'll see how many people say it. Israel is worse than the Nazis. The IDF is worse than the Gestapo. And the two people who most prominently say this are two Jews. Uh, Gilad Atzmon, a former Israeli, who's now a very prominent jazz a musician in England, has a tremendous following. He has thousands of people following his Twitter uh, account, his Facebook. Um, he apologized to the Gestapo a few years ago. He said, I'm so sorry. I actually once compared the Israeli military to the Gestapo, and I apologized because the Gestapo was not nearly as bad, he said. And you go and you read his rantings. Can any human being believe that? Can any human being compare a nation desperately trying to defend its civilians against rocket attacks to a systematic effort to kill six million people, a million babies, just because of the birth, of the accident of their birth? Of they were born Jewish, including Catholic priests who had converted, including uh, people who hadn't practiced Judaism. How can you even utter those words? And yet Norman Finkelstein repeatedly says that in all of his writings. Norman Finkelstein, who is a, a, a lunatic, a lunatic with a very low IQ, who's been a total failure at everything he's ever done, fired from every school he's ever taught at, Brooklyn College, Hunter College, NYU, Columbia, is a, a really good resume. Everywhere he's gone, he's been fired. I recently went to Europe and I spoke and I was told by some of my hosts, oh, it's interesting you're here because America's leading Jewish intellectual has just spoken at our university, Norman Finkelstein. America's <laughs> leading Jewish intellectual. That's what he's called in parts of Europe. And when I went to Norway a couple of um, six months ago, I was invited to go to Norway. And you know, there are three great Norwegian universities uh, in the three large cities in Norway. And maybe once every five years, they have an opportunity to hear a Harvard professor, a Yale professor, a Princeton professor. I don't want to elevate those schools, but you know, they're prominent schools around the world. And they love to get Harvard professor to go up to one of the small cities in, in Norway. So my hosts volunteered to allow me to come and speak to each of the three universities without fee, without travel expenses, for absolutely nothing. Each of the three universities turned me down. Uh, one of them said, we'd love to have you come and speak about the O.J. Simpson case. As long as you promise you won't talk about Israel. I was thinking of giving a lecture on O.J. Simpson and the Israel issue, but <laughs> I didn't think it would work. And so I said, no, I, I would not do that. To their credit, in each of the three universities, student groups invited me. And I started my lectures in each of the three universities by saying, students, your faculty, are here or not here, they don't trust you. They don't want you to hear both sides of the issues. You've heard Finkelstein. You've heard Atzmon. You've heard Mearsheim. You've heard Walt. You've heard Elan Pape. You think you've heard all sides of the issue. You've heard extreme, extraordinary right, left-wing anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, moderate left-wing extreme anti-Semitism, and maybe a little bit more to the center, but you've never heard anything like a pro-Israel speaker. And the students gave me a standing ovation. They didn't agree with everything I said. Clearly, they had been brainwashed for many years. Many of them had signed a petition calling to the end of the occupation. Capital T, capital O. The occupation, beginning in 1960, in 1948. That's the occupation they were talking about. They weren't talking about an occupation in 1967. They were talking about an occupation beginning in 1948. And that's what's going on at European uh, universities uh, today. And then you got Noam Chomsky. He doesn't say, to his credit, he doesn't say that Israel is worse than the Nazis. He says they're just as bad. He compares them to the Nazis. But he doesn't say they're worse. But he compares them to the Nazis. It's an odd thing for him to be saying, having written an introduction to a book by a man named Forasan, who was a Holocaust denier, and Chomsky was prepared to jump into bed with a Holocaust denier, not only defend his right to free speech, which I would do as well, but write an introduction. What a difference. 
There's an enormous difference between defending somebody's right to speak and handing out leaflets and urging people to come and listen to the speech. I know I've defended the worst people in the world, but I don't support them. I don't defend them. I tell them I'll defend you from 9 to 5, 5 o'clock at night. I'm out condemning you. I'll give you an interesting story about that. So Arafat died. Uh, uh, his death was untimely. If he only died four years earlier, we might have had a peace process because he wouldn't have been there in 2000, 2001 to reject and to commit what Prince Bandar of Saudi Arabia called a crime against the Palestinian people. But he died a few years later, and Justice for Palestine students at Harvard decided they wanted to fly the Palestinian flag to commemorate his death. Harvard foolishly said, no, you can't fly the Palestinian flag. You can only fly flags of countries that are part of the United Nations. We're a university against that rule. I don't know. So who do the Palestinian students come to to defend their free speech rights? Me. So they asked me if I would defend their right. I said, sure, I'll defend your right. And I will, I think, win the case. But you have to understand that when you put that flag up, I will be there handing out leaflets telling the truth about Yasser Arafat. And they said, that's OK. And it was a wonderful day. They hung their flag, I handed out the leaflets, the First Amendment, freedom of speech prevailed, and we won the debate in the marketplace of ideas. And, you know, it's important to take on these cases and these causes in the marketplace of ideas. Let me tell you another story about that. You all know that Michael Lauren was invited to speak at the University of California, and they tried to prevent him from speaking. A year earlier, I was invited, and they tried to prevent me from speaking, but I'm not as polite as Michael Orr, and I just shouted over them, and I wouldn't let them uh, uh, interrupt me. But I started the speech. It was an audience about this size, and there were about 100 students on this side wearing kippot and blue and white and Israeli flags, and about 100 students on this side wearing Palestinian flags and fears and, and having, you know, Palestine, we will be free from the river to the sea, that kind of thing. So I started, before I started my speech, I said, I just want to ask, how many students in this room regard yourselves as generally pro-Israel? hundred hands went up there, smattering of hands in the middle. How many of you regard yourselves as pro-Palestine? hundred hands go up there, smattering in the middle. How many of you really haven't made up your mind? A lot of hands went up. I said, all right, now I want to ask two questions. One to the pro-Israel group. How many of you in the pro-Israel group would accept a Palestinian state living side by side without terrorism uh, with agreed upon borders, et cetera, et cetera, demilitarized, et cetera. Every hand went up without any thought. I then said, now I want to turn to the pro Palestinian group. How many of you would accept a non expanding uh, Israel state, one that had agreed upon borders, et cetera, et cetera, living in peace? They mumbled among each other. You could see they were looking for their leader. They all, not a single hand went up. The debate was over. The 800 people in the middle understood this was not pro Israel, pro Palestine. It was pro-Israel and Palestine on one side, and anti-Israel on the other. That these were not people who were as interested in a Palestinian state as they were interested in their not being a Jewish state. And it's so important for that point to be made. Look, President Abbas, who was generally a reasonable man, told the truth the other day when he spoke to a group of Israeli, quote, intellectuals who, and leftists who supported the unilateral declaration at the UN, and he said to them, we are going to the United Nations to complain about the occupation of Palestine for the last 63 years. What happened 63 years ago? 63 years ago, Israel was established as a result of the UN, as a result of the UN declaration, and as a result of Israel's own declaration of independence and willingness to sacrifice the lives of 1% of its population who died as the result of the armed effort to prevent that from happening. But deep down, there is so much interest in the Arab world, one sees it in Egypt, one sees it in Turkey, one sees it in Jordan, we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail later during the conversation, that deep down there is a desire that there not be a Jewish state. Even, even Fayyad will not say the words. I was with him. I had lunch with him. I was with him in, the, in Ramallah about a year ago. And we became friendly. His daughter goes to MIT. He's a nice guy. You know, he's very Western oriented. And we were joking a lot with each other. And I said, all right, I think we can really move the ball forward. I'd like you just to repeat after me the following words. He said, well, what are they? I said, I, I recognize, recognize the right, the right, he said it, of Israel, of Israel to exist. He said all that. And then I said, as the nation state of the Jewish people. I can't say that. I said, I'm not even saying Jewish state the nation state of the Jewish people. He said, look, 
You call yourselves, or let Israel call itself what it wants. Don't ask us to recognize you as the nation state of the Jewish people. I said, but when you combine that with your unwillingness to give up the right, so-called right of return, what you're sending is a message to the Israelis that this is a temporary solution. This is one step on the road to something else. It's like, you know, people very, get very confused when they hear the term Judeo-Christian country. The United States is a Judeo-Christian country. Judeo-Christian is actually a theological concept, a Christian theological concept. Jewish on the way to becoming Christian. And therefore, I don't ever accept the Judeo-Christian concept uh, or the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, there's the Jewish Bible and the Christian Bible. Uh, and word formulations matter. And the word formulations that the Palestinians are willing to say to their own people out of one side of the mouth and then to the Western world out of the other side of the mouth sends a very, very powerful message of what the intentions are. Now, would Fayyad and Abbas accept a two-state solution today? Yes, they would. Uh, would they give up any claim of ending Israel's existence as a Jewish state? No, they won't. And when I had a long talk with President Clinton recently, former President Clinton, many people in many communities wish he were current President Clinton, but that's a different story. We'll talk about that uh, later. Uh, but and, and I asked him about Camp David, and he said he was shocked. He thought Camp David, that 2000-2001 negotiations, would have difficulty over the division of Jerusalem. He said, that didn't present a real problem. Uh, everybody knew where the division would have to be. The real problem was Arafat could not accept the end of the right of return. He couldn't accept the permanency of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. That was what he thought would get him assassinated. And that's what got Sadat assassinated, he thought. And that's what got King Abdullah I assassinated. And that would get him assassinated. And Clinton said he told him. President Arafat, Chairman Arafat, you know, a brave leader is prepared to be assassinated. Uh, and we know that Rabin suffered that ultimate fate because he wanted to do something very courageous and very bold. You could agree and disagree, but it was very courageous and very bold. And so you get that kind of hatred that's directed against the Jewish state. You get phrases like war criminals being used, and that comes from Goldstone. That's what Goldstone was saying. He called the Israeli military war criminals. That is a terrible thing to say. It involves not only effects, but intentions. He's now rescinded that. He's now said, if I knew now what I knew then, I would not have said that Israel intended to kill civilians. Of course Israel didn't intend to kill civilians. It has no benefit from killing civilians. It tried everything in its power. No country in history has ever made 100,000 phone calls and dropped a million leaflets warning the civilian population of where the bombs would be coming, reducing military effectiveness in an effort to save as many lives as possible. Was it perfect? No. Is any war perfect? Of course not. That's why we so desperately try to avoid war and engage in it only as a last recourse. And then there's the divestment, boycott and sanctions. They won't work, they will fail, but what they're doing is trying to create a model of opposition to Israel that parallels the model that was used successfully against South Africa. And here, I think, is the most dangerous aspect of what's going on on college campuses today. And for me, uh, the facilitators of this are well-meaning people sometimes. And here I mean to include both J Street and Peter Beinhart, who's somebody I know well, and who's writing a book uh, that will be a big bestseller in the United States. And what they're doing is they're claiming that our generation, I look roughly around the room, and I see many of you my age, some a little older, some a little younger, but the generation of Jews that remembers 1948, that remembers 1967, that remembers 1973, that remembers Entebbe. That generation of Jews, J Street, is telling the world, and Peter Beinhardt is telling the world, that's your grandfather's Cadillac, your grandfather's automobile. That's old fashioned. Join the new Jews, the new supporters of Israel. We're the supporters of Israel who support the United States condemning Israel in the Security Council when it, uh, when it uh, does something that uh, we disagree with. 
Uh, we're the group of Jews who thinks it's okay to bring Goldstone to the United States and introduce him to members of Congress. We're the group of Jews who think Iran doesn't pose a substantial threat to America and we should take the military option uh, off the table. We're the group of Jews who think Israel is primarily at fault, not the Palestinians, for why there is no peace in the Middle East. And what they are doing is they are breaking down the greatest tradition in Jewish life, Lador Vordor, from generation to generation. They are dividing us by generations. They are turning our children against us. They are turning our grandchildren against us. They are trying to turn our students against us. There is nothing more dangerous than that divisiveness that's occurring today within the Jewish community. And it has a benign face, the face of liberalism, the face of progressivism. Well, no one is more progressive than Erwin Cutler, and I hold myself out in the same way. We are progressive supporters of Israel. We are similarly supporters of Israel. We were there before the founder of J Street was in diapers. We understand what it means to defend Israel from a liberal perspective. And we will continue to do so. And they are trying to persuade the world that people like us don't exist. When you read the writings of Peter Beinhardt, he doesn't ever mention an Irwin Cutler or an Alan Dershowitz, because we don't support his thesis. We are liberals, progressives who support Israel. J Street had to go so far as to create an ad. Google. Google the ad on television. You won't believe it. If any of your children belong to J Street, show them this ad. It says... There are two groups, those who are favor peace and those who are against peace. Those who are against peace, and then it shows Newt Gingrich, and they have, have him saying, I don't think Israel should give up the territories. Sarah Palin, and they have her saying, I don't think Israel should give up the territories. I don't believe in the two-state solution. Then they have me, standing right next to them. I've never voted for a Republican in my life. I, my hand would fall off before the leader would get pulled. But I'm in bed with Sarah Palin and Newt Gingrich, and they have my lips moving. <laughs> and then they have somebody else uttering words that I've never said in my life. And they're sending this out, and they're saying, these are the three people who hate peace. Who, which side are you on? Their side, or Barack Obama then comes up on the screen, and Hillary Clinton comes up on the screen. Those are my friends. <laughs> uh, those are people who... I am on their side, generally. But J Street can't tolerate that. It can't abide the notion that there are older people. It's real ageism at its worst. I mean, it really, if there were a statute that prohibited age discrimination in political dialogue, J Street and Pina Beinhardt would be guilty of violating that statute. They try to divide the world into the young and the old. And they try to appeal to the young and to be sexy and with it and politically correct and, you know, a lot of it grows out of the fact that young people are embarrassed today to support Israel. Has anybody read The Finkler Question? It's a wonderful, wonderful novel that won the big prize in England, the Booker uh, Prize. And he creates a group called The Ashamed of Jews. And he really, really takes after them very, very effectively. That's what we're experiencing. A lot of young Jews who have been made ashamed to support Israel, a lot of them support Israel in their heart. They're just afraid to tell their friends and colleagues. I wrote the case for Israel because a kid came over to me at one point and said, uh, I need you to give, it was just about this time of the year. He said, I need you to give me chuba. I said, I can't give you chuba, I don't even know you. He said, I did a terrible thing. I failed to do something, really. It's a crime omission. I said, what? He said, I went to Ramaz, Yeshiva. I went to Camp Ramah. I went to, um, I'm very well Jewishly educated, I've been to Israel for a year, and I never speak up in my class. When people attack Israel in dinner, I never speak up. I said, why not? He said, well, I'm embarrassed to say, but if I'm perceived as a Zionist, people won't like me at Harvard, I won't get dates. So I started a little humorous campaign, I said, support Zionism, date a Zionist tonight. I helped, <laughs> helped a couple of Zionists, but it didn't help the cause very much. That's when I decided to write the case for Israel. I had to show that you could be progressive. You can support the important values of equality, of women's rights, of the environment, and other progressive causes, and, and, and for that reason be a supporter of Israel. I'm not a supporter of Israel despite my liberalism. I'm a supporter of Israel because of my progressive values and because of my liberalism. And J Street doesn't accept that and can't really uh, 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 
uh, fit it into its agenda. So I want to leave a lot of time for our conversation with Erwin, and so I'm going to leave to the 